professors Daniel Dennett, Michael Heller. Thank you for coming here. Delighted. And um, the subject of today's conversation would be necessity and chance. And you deal most with the subject of mind and how it evolved. And you deal mostly with the subject of the universe. Also, to some extent, how it evolved. So my question to both of you would be, um, with a short intro, the classical point of view that you both seem to be slightly against is that everything is planned, everything is designed by a mind, and I mean everything. But now we know that both the solar system and even possibly laws of physics have some freedom in it, and that the human mind as well has not necessarily been designed in detail. What memory does, what thinking does, what planning does to the mind. So how would you locate your points of interest on the line chance and necessity? What is necessary in mind nature? What is coincidental in mind nature? But I don't know where to start. So maybe somebody would like to go first. Alphabetically. <laughs> Alphabetically, all right. Um, I think we have had a perspective for 200 years, not quite, 150 plus, since Darwin, that we can per conceive of nature, the biosphere, as having evolved by, uh, by a process which itself has no mind behind it, no designer, no, no lawgiver even, and that the uh, regularities of nature fall out of the processes, the patterns of differential reproduction that uh, make all the biosphere, all the various species. Now, when we push back and say, yes, but how about the laws of nature? How about the laws of physics? And now we're um, into Professor Heller's territory. I'll just be a bit provocative and say, it seems to me that the laws of physics also can be accounted for as falling out of a process which has no uh, intelligent lawgiver behind it. It's a di difficult question. And I would start just from the remark that uh, human mind and every living being, in spite of the fact that any organism is a strictly localized thing in space and time, by the very fact that it is a living thing or thinking thing, it is also, in a sense, a global uh, idea. Uh, to see what I mean, uh, it's enough to, uh, to remember that um, our organism is made, so to speak, of um, organic chemistry. That means a carbon. And to produce carbon, you need a long history. We uh, now are able to reconstruct the evolution of carbon, starting from the mm -hmm. very first moment after the Big Bang, and then how uh, all these nuclear reactions went on in the several uh, generations of stars, and uh, how the carbon was found in our motherly star, our sun. And uh, then, uh, if you look at our hand, these atoms which compose our hand were in a couple of uh, generations of stars. So yes. we, are, yeah. we are global things. Yeah. And uh, since, since the evolution of carbon required such a long history, and we know that the universe is expanding. So during this, well, four, 14 billion mm -hmm. years, if the universe expanded into a very huge uh, volume, huge space. Uh, this means that 
the very fact that we exist here, even if the life is present only in the single planet, mm -hmm. then the universe, in order to produce it, had to be old and big. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, our mind and our organism is a, a global thing. So if we uh, are dealing with, we are thinking about the chance and necessity, we cannot separate biological evolution from the cosmic evolution. No, I think that's right. Um, yeah. I, I like the way you put it too. Um, uh, e even the elements are not elemental, that is to say they had yes. to be constructed and they had to be uh, s sort of sorted out and different processes responsible for uh, uh, achieving different chemical elements. Yeah. And so, uh, as you say, it takes a long time <laughs> to make a, yeah. a human being, for the instance. Biological evolution is but a yeah. single fiber in a global that's right. evolution. Yes. Yeah. So I think that's right. Yeah. They should be yeah. considered together. <clears throat> but was it necessary? I mean, could there be no carbon? Yeah, very, very much so. It, it, everything depends on the initial conditions of yeah. the universe. And as we know, uh, they are extremely sensitive for small changes. Uh, so uh, the universe had to be, at, in the beginning, very um, fine, finely tuned in order to produce carbon. Any single, you know, perturbation mm. of the initial conditions, for instance, if the uh, speed of the expansion was a little bit faster or a little bit slower, ca carbon would not be, be able to be produced mm. because if the universe, uh, the speed of expansion is smaller than it was, but a teeny, tiny, tiny fraction, then the universe would recollapse immediately and it, it, there would be no time to produce to anything interesting. Yeah. And if it's too fast, the expansion of the universe, <coughs> then there would be no chance for, for galaxies to form, for stars mm. to form, and there will be probably no conditions for, for place, for, for planets, for, for, instance. for planets and to start yeah. biological yeah. evolution. So everything the, is extremely fine-tuned, and this is, the, well, this the fi it's, it's fine-tuned, or uh, it isn't fine-tuned, it's uh, the amplification of noise. Um, I like to point out to people that in uh, evolution by natural selection, it's a process which amplifies noise. That's why it's so hard to predict the future of evolution. It's, uh, mutations hardly ever occur. Mm -hmm. But without mutation, you don't get any evolution. Um, mutations that are good hardly ever occur. But if mm -hmm. there weren't very rare instances of it, we wouldn't have any, any uh, 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 natural selection. Um, and as you're pointing out, it, it took a, a very rare, if you sort of try to count the different ways things could have been, uh, the conditions under which carbon could develop, very, very rare in the set of physically possible, apparently mm -hmm. physically possible states. And uh, uh, so our universe is one 14 billion year amplification of that initial moment. Yeah. In cosmology, there is a great problem with uh, what you have mentioned, uh, this initial noise. Mm -hmm. uh, in physics, when we want to say that the noise is completely random, we say sometimes white noise. Like, like the yeah. white light is a yeah, mixture yeah. of all white wavelength. And um, there was an idea in cosmology that in the beginning, uh, the initial conditions were chaotic, and a kind of, uh, of select, natural selection among them produced something. But uh, unfortunately, this idea seems not to work in cosmology. In, in present cosmological models, which, <coughs> which well, very well um, correspond to the ex experimental observational data, which are, uh, are, are very powerful criterion. 
uh, everything shows that uh, in the beginning, the, the initial conditions of, of our universe, or more strictly of the present phase of the expansion of the universe, because we do not know what was before, mm -hmm. even whether th there was something mm -hmm. before was meaningless or, no. or, or not. There are many subs you know, suspicions that time did not exist before <laughs> the Big Bang. Well, and um, uh, so the, co the almost consensus nowadays in cosmology is that the initial conditions had to be very, very special, and we do not know why. And we have some hopes that if the finally the quantum gravity theory is invented, it will probably answer that question. That's, I, I know the hope, um, and I appreciate the uh, reason for the hope yeah. in that it would, would permit an answer to the question. Um, but it seems to me just as easy to suppose that the hope uh, will not be fulfilled, and we are left with um, a meta question. Uh, instead of asking, why is there something rather than nothing? Yeah, that's we should question. just say, why not? Uh, uh, it's not as if this universe is somehow more expensive <laughs> or... Uh, I think the, the very question has a perspectival presupposition which is optional. Uh, well, my so to speak, guiding idea in doing science is a methodological rule that we always have an obligation to explain the universe in terms of the universe itself. Yeah, I'm trying with me. Yeah. And, but I think uh, that is a yeah. methodological uh, yeah. well um, postulate, and probably we will never know for sure whether it's also a kind of ontology behind that, or perhaps there is something which exceeds our possibilities. Uh, that is an open yeah, question. And my point is simply, I think, consistent with what you just said, um, not all well-formed questions have answers. For instance, if I go down to the beach and I point to one grain of sand and I mm -hmm. say, why is this grain of sand here? You know, rather than there or in China. <sighs> There's no reason. It just happens to be here. It's, it, it, it's, uh, there's no, uh, reason why it has to be here, but it is. Uh, well, do you think, excuse me, do you think there are major unanswerable questions? Because this is an example of a trifle sort of question, why this grain of sand is here and not there. But here we have a question of why is there carbon? Why are there stars? Why is there humanity at mm. all? Would you why say that is there why? <laughs> why is there why? why? Is, there why yeah. are there, is there the possibility that even the largest questions are unanswerable? Because you seem to be sort of against mysterianism, yeah. as you mm -hmm. like to call it. Well, um, first we have to distinguish two really distinct why questions. One is, uh, in English, how come? And the other is, what for? Um, if we ask, um, why does ice float? We can answer that in terms of physics. It's, uh, we could postulate an answer in terms of what for. And we could say, well, it was arranged for ice to float so that the fish could swim comfortably under the ice during the winter. Uh, that's why ice floats. It could have sunk, but... Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, I much prefer the how come answer. I think there's no, no shred of evidence for the what for. So we have to distinguish. When we're asking um, why does carbon exist, if we just ask the how come question, well, uh, Professor Heller has just told us very, very succinctly 
how come carbon exists? How, how it was a, his, a historical process, a process in time over billions of years that generated the carbon. That's, that's how come it's here. It, it, it is a, you might say, a process narrative. But um, that leaves unasked the question of whether or not there's also a purpose there. That's a different question, but if you ask how come there's carbon, the answer would be, if I'm not mistaken, because laws of physics are the way they are. Is there a how come laws of physics are the way they are? Is there an answer to that one? Because yeah. this is just you know, sweeping it under the rug, so to speak. The laws of physics are um, behind uh, what we are talking about from the very beginning. Yep. And this is a big question. Uh, roughly speaking, perhaps there are two possibilities. Either the laws of physics uh, are the only possible, the, the, the laws of physics we know or we think we know, there are the set of these laws of physics is the only one possible. And the, uh, the argument is that um, if you change anything, uh, a little, little small detail, then the whole edifice of law of physics would collapse. So it, it has a very rigid, well, in mathematics this is called the concepts are rigid. If, if the concept is rigid, if you try to change it, it collapses. And so if the laws of physics are such a construct that they are very rigid, you cannot do anything with them because uh, they will collapse to, to, to well, uh, to form uh, contradiction. Uh, and many physicists believe that this is what is constitutive property of the law of physics. The other um, uh, philosophy, which nowadays is perhaps more fashionable, at least in the popular literature, is that anything goes. Any, any combination of physical constants and everything which can be mathematically imagined could be uh, implemented as the laws of physics. And uh, this is a philosophy behind the idea of multiverse. Uh, there are many universes because there are more possible uh, various um, sets of physical laws. <coughs> well, the, the word set is not correct because uh, there are entities which are bigger than sets and we call them collection. Mm -hmm. There are paradoxes on infinity and so on and so on, but uh, let's leave that aside. Uh, and um, well, uh, and we do not know which, which of these two options is, is correct, whether the laws, in, if there are many possibilities, infinite number of possibilities, then perhaps could be a kind of natural selection between them. Yes. But if there is only one, mm -hmm. then it's a rigid yeah. uh, structure. Well, there is a but, third but, option. Yeah. Just, excuse me, just very quickly. There is only one, but it could have been different. It's logically possible. Uh, For instance, there is actual freedom in the laws of physics and the uh, natural constants. It could have been different, but the universe is just one. Isn't it a possibility? Well, as far as I know, the adherents of that idea claim that it's only one possible set, and any other, mm -hmm. a, any other entity like that is, is excluded by the very nature of, of, of necessity. Huh. Well. Yes, let's, let's see if we can um, make that a little bit sharper. Um, when we talk about logical possibility, uh, I mean, uh, if we distinguish, as many philosophers want to do, between logical possibility and uh, some other kind of possibility, let's call it physical possibility, uh, then, of course, we might say, um, the laws of physics that we seem to get a pretty good handle on today are uh, not logically necessary, but they're the only laws of physics 
that yield a universe where there can be physicists, for instance. Uh, and so uh, uh, the, this is also one way of putting of the, the multiverse. Anthropo anthropo anthropic yeah, and, principle. Yeah. It's also uh, uh, <coughs> shared with the, with the uh, I think multiverse to, idea. Um, to make our discussion more concrete, we yeah. should impose some boundary condition of this Good. set of, imp of immense possibilities, immense number of possibilities. So let's, let's uh, agree that the universe is like it is. We have these laws of physics. Yeah. And how chance and necessity operate in this concrete universe. Fair enough. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's use a very specific example, the human mind. Uh, you are one of the champions of the method of dealing with the human mind by taking into account evolution. So the mind could have been completely different or not. Uh, it's not a clearly formed question. Um, first of all, how different is different? No two minds are alike. Um, it, it, it could have been the case that it was uh, the descendants of ostriches that were the uh, language using science making uh, 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 entities on the planet. And if that happened, now I'm sure that the, the minds would be in some ways very different. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you have uh, science discovering minds, then I think probably Euclidean geometry will be in common, uh, uh, however different the uh, symbols that are used, uh, uh, arithmetic will be the same. Or instance. a collective mind like, like ants or bees. Yes, uh, yes indeed. Um, it, it, it is a possibility. Um, and uh, it was our rival possibility, I think, uh, during the evolution. Um, yes, it's a, in some sense, yeah. Um, not a very close rival yeah. because not very direct competition. But no, that's, that's true. And in fact, uh, they may win. There <laughs> were some philosophers, for instance, Teilhard de Chardin, who dreamed, mm -hmm. dream, had a dream that at one stage of our future evolution, yeah. the humanity will form a collective mind. Yes, and there's a lot of people talking about that today in rather more uh, detailed and I would say um, disciplined ways. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's, a, uh, it's a possibility in principle. To some extent, this has already happened. I mean, you, I, uh, as this I was is one of your points yes, in, from bacteria to bar that we don't invent the tools that we use every day. It's not our tool to use English to be able to plug a microphone and to speak about Teilhard de Chardin. This is the tools of our mind, but they are not ours. Not, well, they are our tools, but we didn't design them. We didn't have to. Meaning mine. Yeah. No, but but um, another point I make is that we're getting more and more comfortable with the idea of a distribution of labor in the business of comprehension. If you have a paper from CERN with a thousand authors, uh, no one of them, no single one of them has to understand the whole thing. And yet we can, the, the system has enough, is itself well enough designed that we can have high confidence in the products and say, yes, we, as, as a collective we, we understand this. No individual does entirely, mm -hmm. but as a, as a as a species, so could we, we understand this. Um, could we say that the five thousand people working in CERN, as a collection, as a group, understand CERN, but neither this or that or this person understands it? Isn't yeah. like the Chinese room argument? No. Well, how? Well, the Chinese room argument was that if you you know, have a group of people with no comprehension at all, then the room itself can have sort of like comprehension. But Sir was against this idea. But now you say that there is distributed comprehension. Well, so I, I think, um, I, I'm not happy with your gloss of Searle's argument, but indeed, I think 
We already know this. Not a single neuron in your brain understands English or Polish or, or the question you just asked, but you do. Uh, right. And your understanding of it, unless we want to be uh, really mysterious, is some function of the organization of those individual neurons in your brain. And, and so in that sense, we already have existence proofs of, of collective understanding. Um, uh, whether the same sorts or principles of organization or different ones are uh, what, will ex what would explain uh, you know, real, genuine group understanding at the scientific level, you know, 5,000 scientists and engineers at CERN. I think that's an interesting question, but it, you get down in the weeds pretty fast. It's not a very uh, uh, easy to uh, explain what the problems are. It reminds me uh, the idea of Popper of three worlds. The first world is the physical world. The second world is our subjective world, the world of our think, uh, thoughts and, and feelings and so on. And then there is a third world, the, th the world of ideas, mm. uh, where all you know, products of our um, scientific thinking, of our arts, uh, exist in a quasi-platonic uh, well, uh, realm. And uh, well, and this, uh, you know, w we give some inputs into that third world, and we also profit of it. Uh, so it's a kind of interaction between uh, our individual uh, thinking and this uh, this uh, huge magazine of human achievements. But uh, I like everything about that except the interaction part. Uh, I don't. I think. Th you can have Popper's three worlds without postulating an interaction between world three and world two. But you have I'll contributed you, so much to that world, and well, you don't think it but is. But I don't. Look, um, um, if I have a sagging screen door and I put a diagonal. Mm -hmm. uh, cable or, or board to make a, a triangle, then thanks to the Euclidean theorem of the uh, uh, rigidity of a triangle, I have fixed my door. And the, the explanation of why the door doesn't sag cites Euclid. But I don't think there's interaction between the triangle and the door, or between Euclid and the door. I, I think interaction suggests a sort of mysterious uh, uh, process. I think the... Everything depends on, on the definition of interaction. Yes, and, that's why I raised the issue. We, <laughs> and I, yeah. I just think that, that, that Popper's use of the term interaction uh, I, was a mistake. I don't think, uh, I don't know whether Popper has uh, used that uh, term interaction. Oh, yes, he has. I, I, I know that Penrose, who. Oh, yes. Uh, he, he uses uh, that extensively. Yes, and, and Popper and Eccles in their yeah. notorious yeah. Uh -huh. book, The Self and the Brain, mm -hmm. um, uh, Popper used the term interaction there. I think one of the, one of the uh, a great philosopher, but that I think was a mistake. But if you are t speaking about definitions, yes. I would like, uh, and uh, this is central mm, topic of our discussion, the, the, the chance. I would like to to ask you and myself what, in fact, is chance. Mm. Uh, and I, I have some answer, <laughs> working answer. W I do too, and it'll be interesting to see wh whether we well, agree. Well, so so start. All right. Um, one, of the, uh, one of our everyday paradigm examples of a chance event is flipping a fair coin. Mm -hmm. Now, strictly speaking, that's not a random, it's not a quantum, ra if it is, we don't know. It, the, 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 whether the coin comes up heads or tail is dependent on the location of every particle in the universe. And it's completely unmanipulable. And that's why we call this 
an uncaused. We say there is, you know, what is the cause of it coming up heads or tails? The answer is, there isn't a cause, it's chance. And that's, I think, a legitimate use of the word chance, which has nothing to do with quantum indeterminism. And my answer would be to ask a mathematician, what is chance? Yeah. First of all, I yeah. would like to notice that the, the term ch chance is not a scientific term. It is a, from the uh, everyday uh, language term. Yes, from gambling uh, Yeah, too. because uh, in physics, for instance, we have a clear uh, criterion what is scientific term and what is not. For instance, uh, mass is a scientific term, energy, because we know how to measure yeah. mass and energy. But matter is not, because we, we don't know how to measure matter. Matter is just a term from the common language. Uh, the similar thing is with, with chance. But if we want to make this term more strict, then we can say that uh, we, we should ask for help a probability calculus. Yep. And uh, we could agree for a definition that a chance is a um, chance event is an event which uh, the, the, the probability of which before it happened so-called a priori probability, is less than one. Uh, if it is one, it, it is not chance, it, it would happen for sure. If it is zero, it will never happen. If it is closer to zero, that, that is more chancy. If it's closer to one, it's less chancy. So I think it's uh, the only reasonable use of, of the term chance uh, as far in, in physics and mathematics is concerned. But this poses the question of the probability calculus. Mm, yeah, exactly. You mentioned the uh, throwing of, of dice. Uh, well, at probability calculus, mm, there's also a philosophical remark. We usually regard in philosophical discussions uh, probability as a sort of, uh, as, as a sort of ontological explanation. If the prob probability of something to happen is great, then we think that it is, uh, well, so, sort of proved that it will happen. Uh, but mathematically, theory of probability is a special uh, case of the measure theory. And I, I will explain that in very, very briefly. Um, uh, for instance, uh, what, what is measure theory? You, you regard a Euclidean space just abstractly, and uh, you consider some subsets of, of this space. And you ascribe, you f define a function to each subset, you describe a number. And he, uh, the convention is that this number is a measure of, of that subset, a volume of it, or mass of it, or electrical charge of it. The idea is to ascribe a number to a subset. Mm -hmm. This set of subsets has to fulfill some conditions, but uh, they are technical uh, thing. And this is a measure theory, the very, very important mathematical uh, theory. And um, if this measure has one additional condition, fulfilled. If it is, uh, in technical terms, if it, if it is uh, mm, normalized to one, that means to say, if the mm, number you ascribe to the whole Euclidean space is one, then it's called probability. Okay. Because, uh, because, because this enforces that the, the measures of, of smaller parts will be a fraction mm -hmm. between zero and this is probability, and um, theory of probability is a purely mathematical idea with no indeterminacy, the feeling of uncertainty. It's pure mathematics, no. and this, uh, what we usually in common language uh, regard as a chance, chance properties of chance, some, uh, well, uh, some. Uh, uh, well, uh, indeterminacy 
in, uh, in predictability, this comes through in interpretation of that function. And one of the interpretations is the so-called um, frequency. Of, uh, uh, yes, uh, and the other yeah. is a sort of Bayesian uh, approach. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And the frequency interpretation, yes. which we ascribe to the throwing of dice. Mm -hmm. So we define a dis what is called distribution function, which says that if we have uh, 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 correct, not falsified dice, then uh, to, to uh, number six, for instance, to, to have a number six, the probability to get some number six is one over, over six. This is a distribution function. And, the, and we take the distribution function from the experience, not from mathematics. Wait a minute. If we're talking about a, a die, a yeah. six-sided die, we are not taking one over six from experience, we're taking it from geometry. From experience, because... Uh, well, it, it, if we have experience with the die and know that it's fair, if it's a loaded die... Well, that's then, another story, but... Then it's it, not one over six. Yeah, it's it, only it's one over six in the ideal. So it's not from experience. But if we want to know how much it de uh, deviates yeah. from one over six, we must make a long series of... Absolutely, yes. So, and this is experience. Okay. So, uh, uh, and what I wanted to say, that the interpretation, uh, this yeah, yeah. frequency of interpretation is the property of the world, not of mathematics. Yeah. So, uh, so what... In this way, a chance is composed into a mathematical structure uh, which we use to describe, or, or to model, is better than to describe the universe. So, uh, so the chance is, is not something unreasonable which comes from nothing, but it is a part of mathematical structure. Oh, sure. I, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm more of a Bayesian myself, but there's good no, uses of frequentist well, reasoning too. But Bayesian interpretation is one of, of many possible yeah, interpretations. Yeah, yeah. And even more than that, which al always fascinates me, that uh, in mathematics there are many improbability theories. Uh, for instance, mm, so, so, so the probability theory we know uh, is only one of, pos of possibilities because there are many measures normed to one. Uh, and the uh, probability we use in quantum mechanics is a bit different than the macroscopic probability. And the problem is when we are speaking about the fundamental level of physics, we are not a priori sure which probability measure is mm. over there, obligatory. Yeah. So, so it, there are many open questions. And we have to perform experiments to yeah. see yeah. that. But it sort of begs the question, you can't ascribe probability to an event that only happened once, right? Because if I understand, ascribing the measure to an event happens after many, many, many tries, right? So w we spoke about two, the probability of the universe ago. being the way it is or the mind being the way it is. Well, we only know one universe and we only know one type of mind, the human mind. So how could we even use the terms chance when it would formally require a number two, of experiments? Two days ago, say. I discussed with my friend, a physicist who is working with quantum information, and he uh, quoted a, a recent article which supports the idea that in quantum mechanics, uh, a single event behaves in a probabilistic manner. So we can use statistics to a one electron. And uh, th this is something in order to uh, interpret some recent uh, uh, results of experiments. There were, long ago, there were subs uh, sub uh, suspicions that uh, in quantum mechanics, statistics could be done on a single um, entity, which, uh, which is something which our uh, common sense her is repugnant to. I'm not sure. Um, uh, but I'm not sure that the uh, mathematical puzzles about probability uh, have much bearing on 
the everyday notion of probability that, and the way we use it in our daily lives, which is important to know. Yeah, certainly, but in, in, we are in the living in a macroscopic world. Yes. But nevertheless, uh, we are speaking about chance, and chance events are, are unexpected. Uh, anyway, uh, everything which happens in the macroscopic world is a kind of average result of, of yeah. the quantum level, and some uh, things we are using every day are some signals from that quantum uh, world. For instance, uh, our, our uh, elevators and, and uh, opening doors are full of, of photocells, and there are quantum effects mm -hmm. us using to that. Uh, so uh, you, never n you never know whether this bigger, n lower level will reveal itself in, in our everyday life. But yeah. of course... Uh, and there are theories of mind, I mean, very controversial, like Penrose's favorite theory, for a time at least, that try to involve the quantum level in, in mind. Do you feel sympathetic to those models? No. <laughs> I don't. Not I've, I've, uh, 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 in fact, I think I was one of the first critics of Penrose. I wrote the first review of, of his Emperor's New Mind. And I think it's, a, in many ways, a brilliant book, wonderful pedagogy on how physics works, great stuff on the second law of thermodynamics and other, other important topics. But then he uh, uses a caricature of what a computational theory of mind would be to uh, uh, argue that the, bra the brain can't be the mind uh, and that we need not just, uh, he's not saying we need a quantum computer, he's saying we need a quantum gravity computer. And I mean, that's getting pretty mysterious. And I don't think he's offered any evidence for that. But all. you do not think that some quantum effects are going on in our brain? Of course they are. Yeah. But the question is whether they're playing a role that a difference that makes a difference. Yeah. That's because the question. if one day we have a working quantum computer, I am sure next day there will be a lot of models of our brain using the analogy with quantum computation. Oh, I'm sure as a sociological fact, that's yeah. that, that's a good bet. Um, but the emergence of the classical computer was a big stimulus to theory of mind. Absolutely. So would, would there be a difference if the quantum computer popped up? <coughs> and you know the probabilities in a quantum no. computer were slightly different. So the role of chance, for instance. I mean, the classical computer is deterministic. In, out, yes. and. But, but yes, but there's a, a point that people often overlook, and that is, computer software today, almost any computer software that does anything interesting consults random numbers all the time. It's, it's the way to design software. Whenever you have a choice point, a, a decision point, and, and the, the program doesn't have the information it needs to make a, a reasoned choice, it throws, it throws the dice and, and tries one thing or another. It's the way you solve the problem of Buridan's ass uh, in the computer program. It happens everywhere. Does the human mind work like this as well? Well, it has to. Uh -huh. But notice, the computer use, when, when the computer uses randomness, it simply calls up the pseudo-random number generator, which is not random. Of course. But it does just as well. The, the, the algorithms it that It simulates. Simulation is a great word. Well, in it simulates, science. but the thing is, the simul is artificial respiration, mm -hmm. simulated respiration, or real respiration it that's works. created by artists. It works, mm -hmm. yeah. and the fact is that that um, uh, uh, to take uh, uh, to take a, a recent example, um, the uh, AlphaGo Zero Go program. Use a pseudo random number generator. Works just, obviously, works just fine. Um, you don't need uh, quantum 
indeterminacy, when you've got physical chaos, when you've mm -hmm. got a pseudo random number generator. So, so I think that's important because Penrose tried very hard to find something that minds could do that you couldn't do without quantum indeterminacy. He failed to find that. I mean, he has not demonstrated to anybody any power of the human mind that, that requires that. So uh, that's why I don't have much, uh, much I, faith in Penrose's theory. I can theory. understand Penrose's, uh, you know, mm. uh, longing for such a thing, for, for, for finding yeah. something in the mind, because he's um, fascinated with uh, this very mysterious quantum process when uh, the probability wave is, mm -hmm. which is, well, is very fuzzy uh, and uh, unpredictable, indeterminacy, mm -hmm. in, in it works in an indeterministic way, and uh, when you make a measurement, it collapses to a single number. And uh, this is something which physicists cannot understand. And he, I think, he has an idea that such a mysterious process, uh, which certainly has some natural explanation, but we don't know, we don't know that explanation, explanation yet, that this extremely interesting process should somehow uh, be reflected in the structure of our mind. Yes, I think that's very well put. I think, I think that's exactly his motivation. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I appreciate and respect the motivation. If, if I were a physicist and working on those issues, I would hope yeah. with all my heart and soul that something in my domain would be the key to, you know, I would explain one mystery with another mystery. And if I can explain my mystery, then maybe I can explain both mysteries. Yeah. And uh, I understand the motivation, but I don't think the grounds for it are, are very promising. And this motivation goes even further, because uh, Penrose <coughs> is a mathematician by training. He's yeah, a mathematician yeah. rather than physicist. And um, mathematics and our mind are two things which are so close to each other. Uh, the, our mind is creating mathematics. But at the same time, mathematics is something much greater than our uh, brain. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the f mathematicians who have some philosophical inclination, uh, inclinations uh, cannot be um, indifferent in this affinity between our mind and, uh, and mathematics. And uh, this is, I think, provides another motivation for Penrose and not only from Penrose. Well, yes, but remember a few mathematicians who thought otherwise, Turing and von Neumann. Mm. They were both deeply interested in these questions of mind, mm -hmm. and they thought they'd found the secret in, yeah. in, uh, uh, in co computation theory. Yeah. But we, we talked about the freedom in what minds could be like, but the topic already popped up. I mean, let's imagine that we throw that dies a number of times and each throw is a different mind on a different planet evolving naturally, would all of them have to discover arithmetic? I mean, all, you mentioned ostrich intelligence yeah, yeah, yeah. or swarm intelligence, yeah. but let's go further. Non-carbon intelligence mm -hmm. on a faraway planet, pure science fiction, but mm -hmm. would they also have to discover Euclid's elements or arithmetic or logic? I think the answer is a qualified yes. Um, no. Probability equals one. Equal mm. I would rather put it this way. Um, uh, this is a case of convergent evolution. Uh, there's some pretty deep mathematical reasons why there's only one arithmetic. Um, so either you find it or you don't have mathematics at all. And uh, chimpanzees don't have mathematics. Dolphins and whales don't have mathematics. We do, and uh, uh, we've, and on other planets in other galaxies, there may be uh, uh, scientific intelligences. And if they uh, have any uh, 
opportunity to uh, explore this part of the space of possibility, then what they will find is arithmetic. Um, now, if we found that, that they used Roman numerals for the numbers, we would be mortally certain that there was some transmission between us and them. Either <laughs> we got it from them or they got it from us. That would be too great a coincidence. But, but that they had, uh, whatever the notation, if they, had a, if they had arithmetic, it would be our arithmetic. How far does it go? I mean, arithmetic, yes. Differential geometry, would the aliens by necessity have to have this sort of, I don't know, Mandelbrot set? What about language? I mean, how far does the necessity go? Well, I, if there are minds, what do yeah. they have to have? Or at well, least, well, that's wouldn't have it any other way? Okay, let's put it We have more. a great warning uh, in this respect, also from the mathematical side. There is a mathematical theory which is called category theory, uh, yes. which was developed well after the Second World War and is now rapidly not only evolving, but uh, well, yeah. uh, conquering all the domains of mathematics. And this is a very philosophically very fascinating domain because um, uh, it shows it is the first theory ever where uh, the logic is not something imposed from outside on the categories, but it is something emerging out of categories. In various categories can be different logic, and we can compute in simple cases which logic it should be. Uh, and uh, also the arithmetics. There could be uh, something which is more general, are not numbers, but the uh, natural number object, which is called, which in some cases reduces to our numbers, but in other cases it does not. So uh, this is a warning that in other civilizations, which would mm -hmm. say started with, not with uh, adding uh, digits, uh, but mm -hmm. wi with some abstract thinking, they could invent first category theory, and then the mathematics could be different. But of course, I believe that there will be a translation between our and their. That's, that's interesting. I, I delved into category theory many years ago uh, and was even obliged to respond to a paper on category theory by Michael Arbib, the, Arbib, yeah. the neuroscientist guy, very interested in category theory. And uh, I did my best to uh, get my head around the puzzles, and I have to say I gave up. I, I never, I, to this day, I don't understand category theory. But I also know, because mm -hmm. I asked, I, I asked mathematician friends of mine, mm -hmm. yeah, professional mathematicians, to explain it to me, even some that knew about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they said they couldn't understand it either. So <laughs> maybe in the last uh, 25 years, this understanding has grown, but yes, certainly yes, hasn't there grown. There was a certainly the a revolution in that. No. Somewhere in the 60s and 70s. Uh, there That's was, when I first heard about yeah, it. Yes. Mm, then uh, in the, uh, there was a um, jump in the, in, in the evolution of the category. Yeah, yeah. But Michael Arby, it reminds me <laughs> a, a mm. nice anecdote. Once he asked me during the, the scientific conference uh, yeah. whether God, it was a provocative question, whether God knows mathematics. Yeah. And I had an well, illumination how to answer him because I knew that it was a, a provocation. And I said, no, he does not. He was a little bit astonished. Why? I answered, because he is mathematics. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, when God calculates, the world becomes. Yes. Uh, this is, this is Leibniz. This is Leibniz. Yeah. But uh, if we enter the speculative yeah, territory course. even further, I mean, uh, again, let's, let's go back. If the mind is somewhat constrained, at least by the results it has to achieve, I mean, logically, does it, I mean, if, if God has a mind, if there is a super mind, would it also have to, by necessity, be of a certain kind? I mean, 
if there is no other way for a mind than to, you know, if, if it's supposed to discover mathematics, then the mind is constrained. An absolute answer, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> I, I, I think maybe Michael and I agree about this. Um, uh, as a, a Darwinian, uh, convinced Darwinian, I want to avoid essentialism always as my first option. And I think we can't say what a mind must have because there's going to be all sorts of quasi-pseudo proto-minds on the boundaries of whatever we're calling a mind and, and they'll be different. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we, we don't want to try to give the essence of a species and we shouldn't try to give the essence of a mind either. Okay, but you did say that even an ostrich mind or a swarm mind would have to, by convergent evolution, come to certain same, I wouldn't even say results, no, but to no, certain I, territories. If I said it would have to, then I was, I guess, speaking a little bit loosely because I would say that um, there would be, as it were, a basin of attraction mm -hmm. to these ideas and, and, and it would be a, uh, a, even a predictable resting place point or, or, uh, or, or transit point, it would get there, uh, yes. but it might not get there. And then we'd have to argue about whether it was a mind or not. Sure. <laughs> but, and I wouldn't want to argue. So there could be completely different minds that have very little in common. Certainly. The mind of a chimpanzee and the mind of a whale mm. don't have much in common. We are talking about evolution and Darwinian evolution. And um, of course, Darwinian evolution would be impossible uh, if, not, if it were not based on physical laws again. No. Yeah. And uh, from the point of view of physics, every evolution is what physicists and mathematicians call is a dynamical system. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is a dynamical system? It consists of three things. First is a great space of, uh, of possible states. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we consider a physical system or biological system, and it can be in various states. Uh, well, if, uh, if our system consists of a single material point under the Newtonian force, then its uh, state is uh, two numbers, position and velocity. Position has three components, velocity has three components of so the space, the, called, the so called phase space yes. uh, it has uh, six dimensions. Of course, oh. if it is a biological system, the number of the dimensions the, uh, is way enormous. Up. But we can simplify it yeah. to, to some reasonable, yeah. uh, for instance, we, it's a um, textbook example uh, the multiplication of bacteria. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a dy dynamical system. The second thing is uh, a path which goes through the sequence of states. Yeah. evolutionary path and this is a curve in a space space mm -hmm. and the third very important point uh, is uh, that must be a dynamics mm -hmm. without dynamics it, it does not work and this dynamics is usually given but not always but usually by differential equation yeah. this is a moving force yes. of the evolution yeah, yeah. and um, this uh, uh, this uh, equation can have various uh, shapes. For instance, it could be a stochastic uh, mm -hmm. equation. And if we, we describe biological evolution, it must be stochastic. Yes. Uh, and uh, moreover, I if the evolution ha has to be a creative process, uh, then I the equation must be nonlinear. Uh, the nonlinearity says that the result is cannot be uh, the sum of its point of, of, of its parts, but may, must be some uh, interaction between them. Yes. Non-linear interaction. Yep. Without that, the evolution will not go. Uh, and uh, in order to have a, a truly um, a, um, creative process, there must be an ad ad admixtion of chaos of the yep. yeah. And this how? How are you distinguishing that from stochastic? Well, uh, uh, the, the mathematics, they are a bit different, but of course you, you can uh, um, combine both of them. 
the, the definition of chaos is the sensibility uh, on the initial conditions. If we a little bit yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. disturb the initial conditions, yeah. the curve goes yeah. different. In, yeah. in, in, in yeah, yeah. Well, and stochastic is that, uh, well, l let us imagine. It's a random walk. Uh, random walk is an example. Yeah. But uh, let us, uh, there, there are some differential equations when uh, the evolution is deterministic to a certain point, yep. and this point, the so-called bifurcation point, yep. is yep. Uh, sensitive for for fluctuations, and the solution can yeah. various okay. ways. So this is how, and at the direction to which the system will go depends on external fluctuations, yep. on chance, and. Uh, it can be that these bifurcation pores f points are very densely packed on the curve. At each point there is a bifurcation. This is a very st strongly stochastic. Yeah. And also, so, so uh, evolution, I want to say, is a, pure, is a fundamentally mathematical concept. So it is not only... Mm, oh, yes, yeah, of course. And, and the biological idea of um, natural selection can be uh, modeled by um, the fact that the system must be open because other, uh, <coughs> well, uh, in order to be nonlinear, it must be open with the admission of chaos. And this interaction between chaos, between initial conditions or boundary conditions, they can model natural yep. selection. This is, this is the point in Darwin's Dangerous Idea in my book where I wrote that what Darwin had really discovered is an algorithm, mm -hmm. a family of algorithms. Yeah. And yes, exactly. It's it's substrate neutral. It's completely abstract, and you can prove all sorts yeah. of things about it. But this considering extremely it rich as structure, yeah? these dynamical systems are yes. extremely rich, and the possibilities are yeah. enormous. Yeah. And to answer your question, whether the evolution could go a different way. Well, it is exactly a territory on which you can speculate mm -hmm. just to have no. some possibilities <coughs> to answer your question. I, I would say that's good. That's good. But and it, it shows. It also means that our own evolution ha had to go through a couple of those bifurcation points. Mm -hmm. I mean, 100,000 years ago, hominids leaving you know, one place and moving to another. I mean, the local conditions influenced yes. what tools we, we have We just made. barely made it, by the way. Just, we, there was, there a, was a tremendous like bottleneck, yes. Yes, yes. Might well have gone extinct. Uh, and yeah. well, and uh, the theory of dynamical systems shows that um, mm -hmm. chance events are not something external which, well, prevents some action of physical laws. It cooperate, yeah. chance cooperate with the physical laws. If you imagine the, the physical laws as a network mm -hmm. of some <coughs> influences, so th there must be some places uh, in this net uh, for ac for uh, left for chances, because yeah, otherwise yeah. the system yeah. would not work. Yeah, no, that's that's what I meant at the outset when I said yeah. that evolution amplifies noise. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the later state of the of the curve it is is only, very much a function not only, of not the, only of the amplifies runner. but the noise makes makes uh, po uh, makes possible uh, the yeah, dynamical exactly. system yeah, yeah. to operate yeah uh, yeah <coughs> you know, evolution without mutations for yeah, instance yeah. but with the let's 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 focus on this point there was this bottleneck the population was kind of low and at this point in ev evolution, uh, the genetic structure of the population sort of becomes amplified later. I mean, slightly yeah. different, a different yeah. group of hunter-gatherers. I mean, the, 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 the yeah. neighbors survived and these didn't. Could this lead to really major macroscopic differences to us nowadays? Wouldn't this, couldn't this be the case that sure. slightly different weather, slightly <coughs> different conditions? Absolutely. And right now, for instance, we wouldn't be using abstract reasoning the way we use it, or memory would work slightly differently, or we wouldn't conceptualize with our bodies the way we do. I mm. mean, yeah. very deep level of how mind works. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a fascinating possibility mm. that a chance event in Africa 150,000 years ago would influence how we have this conversation right now and how we think. How I, I, I'm sorry I'm coming back to this problem, but I think it's really fascinating. How much freedom is there in just 
how our minds could be and how it depends on a lightning storm somewhere in Africa. Absolutely. How, how do you see um, it? Uh, one time I was in Moscow with a group of philosophers, including my, my American colleague Jaguan Kim, who, who's, who was actually born in Korea. And he was born practically on the border between North and South Korea. And he said, you know, had his parents moved, you know, a few hundred yards in one direction, um, he wouldn't be an American. And think of all the differences between his life uh, as an American philosopher and his whatever his life, yes. whatever his life might have been had he been a citizen of North Korea. In, in, the, in the medieval uh, philosophy, yeah. there was a nice term to describe this dependence yeah. of of many conditions, uh, contingency. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So our our fate is contingent, dependent on yeah, on so true. many, uh, of the almost infinite number of factors. Right. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much for being here, for talking, and I think we ended up on a high note. Okay, so excellent. Good, thank, thank you. you very much. Which chance events caused our <laughs> meeting here? And just as we agreed, we will start the conversation at a point and let it bifurcate along its own yes, creodes. Yes, yes. And mm -hmm. I think it went yes. pretty well. Thank, thank you. you. A very dynamical system. Very dynamical. A very chaotic, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.